right, let's get ready to do it tonight. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. In Job chapter 11 tonight, we're going to see that Zophar takes his turn. He steps up to the mic now, and now it's his time to shoot his mouth off for a while. Amen? We've listened to his, the two buddies shoot their mouth off now, and now we're going to let him step up to the mic and shoot his mouth off about a man that he can only dream about being like. <laughs> but that's usually how it goes. So, <laughs> Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11, and uh, we're going to begin here tonight. So before we begin, go ahead and pray, Brother Tim, off and bridle, for the Lord will bless the Bible study and the verse-by-verse -verse covering and probably a little bit of preaching. Who knows? So pray the Lord a blessing. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church, fine, to sit under the reading of your word. God, I just want to thank you for the truth that you've given us. And you're talking about thankfulness, and my mind just went to, you know, I have the truth, Father, and, and so many of us. Words, Father, pray to help Brother Dennis now. Please. And just fill him with the right spirit, Father. If he yes. To preach him and help him to do that. If he's to stay and teach him, help him do that. Whatever needs to come out, just pray that you would guide him and just fill him with your spirit now. Pray for our hearts to be open to receive and be applied to our lives and we can get something that will help us further glorify you. Mm. And Father, I just want to thank you again just for your goodness and your grace and mercy. Uh, Father, just your long suffering in our lives. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now remember, these are the three friends that are falsely accusing Job. They said anybody that would lose their family and have all these bad things happen to them all at once has got to be an evil man. There has to be something wrong with them. And so they're making all these false statements. And, and remember what I told you that you find very much in the book of Job that you have to understand. A lot of what these three fellows say that show up supposedly to be his friends, but the Bible says, as Job tells them later, you miserable comforters. Uh, they didn't bring him much comfort, comfort at all. But a lot of what these fellows are saying is true. They make a lot of good theological, doctrinal statements. They're saying the truth, but they're applying it wrong. They're applying it, and they, they, they don't, they're not privy to information about what's happened to this man. And they're making the wrong judgment. And we're going to revisit that at the end of this study, make a few uh, closing remarks that are practical in nature when we finish tonight. But please remember, you and I better keep our mouth shut about what's going on in somebody else's life when we don't know what all is really going on. I know we think we do, but we don't. And you don't know why somebody's going. They may be going through a hard time because God, because they are doing something right. They could be going through a hard time because God is judging them, but you don't know. And by the way, if we're so quick to deem that it's the judgment of God in somebody else's life when they're going through a hard time, why don't we ever step back and say, yeah, that's why I'm going through a hard time? You know, we're quick to say, well, they're going through a hard time because all they did that was wrong. Well, why is it every time you're going through a hard time, you just say, I just don't know. Times have just been so hard. God's judging you. You go, hey, 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 hey. Well, you said the same thing about her. You said the same thing about him. See? See how that stuff comes back? You gotta, we got to be careful of that stuff. Here we go. Zophar, he, he's going to take his turn now. Verses 1 and 2 then answered Zophar, uh, the Nahamathite, and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Now, he is a... Naamathite, possibly that's a, some kind of certain city located somewhere in Arabia in that time of the biblical days. And he's accusing Job of running his mouth and making no sense. And some people do that. Some people do that. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 3, a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. In other words, we got to be careful. If we keep on talking and keep on talking and you keep on talking, eventually you're going to start saying some things that really ain't that good. I don't know if this is true or not, but I understand that John Wesley, the great establisher of the Methodist Church, that John Wesley years ago was sitting down and talk with a fellow, and after a certain point, after he's talked a while, he just wouldn't say anything else. And you could talk to John Wesley all you want to, but my understanding is he just wouldn't talk to you no more. 
John Wesley figured this verse was right. He said, if we just keep on talking, we're going we're gonna to be saying some things we don't need to say. So I'm just going to shut up at this point. I wish I would have learned from John Wesley <laughs> years ago. That would have helped me and helped my marriage too, wouldn't it, Darby? Amen. You hear that? Happy marriage. Happy marriage, fellas. Amen. All right. And then you have that verse, uh, pr those couple of verses, Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest I also be likened to him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. You say, what, are they contradicting? No. Sometimes you need to answer foolish things so people will shut up and just back off. But sometimes the best thing you can do is not get entangled and answer them with anything because they're not going to listen. And, and, just, and you trying to argue back with them gives them very you know, verification that they, they think they're right. You know, listen, he's having to respond to me. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just not say anything, not respond. Just that's what Christ did. Remember that? He didn't say a word. He, there, were, there was a time, there were times when he did rebuke and he did answer to the accusations. Remember that when you read through the gospel? But there were other times when Christ didn't say a word. It was something, you know, Hate to reference an old song, but like old Kenny Rogers said years ago, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. I hate to use a poker illustration, but, but, but sometimes it's time to talk, and sometimes it's not time to talk. And you have to pray and be able to discern when that is, because if you talk when you're not supposed to talk, you're going to get in trouble. And if you don't talk when you're supposed to talk, you're going to get in trouble. And we have to, only the Lord can help us with that kind of stuff. Should thy lies make men hold their peace, and when thou mockest shall no man make thee ashamed? Falsely accusing Job of lying and mocking God and others. Job wasn't lying. They're accusing him of lying. They're saying, hey, you've got to be lying. Confess up. There's no way, no way you could be going through all these bad things you're going through if you didn't have unconfessed sin in your life. But see, that's the way people think, isn't it? For thou hast said, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. Well, Job did have some self-righteousness that we'll see later, but he also admitted that he was a sinner back in chapter 7. So, so again, they're, t they're distorting things. They're taking things out of context. That's what wicked people do. Listen to me. That's what wicked people do when they distort things, take things out of context, try to trap you in your words. You understand what I'm saying? We, we don't ever want to be involved in that as Christians, folks. N never, never, never. Never want to be involved in that as Christian. Um, but oh, that God was speaking, open his lips against thee. How about that? What, what so far is desiring that God will step in and agree with me and rebuke Job like I am. <laughs> well, he is. He is before the book's over, but he's also going to rebuke oh, so far. See, when you want God to step in and rebuke another fellow, you just wait, Holmes. He's going to get you too. All this, get them, God, get them, God, reveal them, expose them, show their sin, make it manifest. Okay, you want them to manifest everybody else's sin, he's going to get yours too. Now, when you think of it like that, you say, okay, Lord, just have grace on that fella. <laughs> like, I want you to have grace on me. Amen? That's the way, it, that's the way that stuff works out. Uh, verse number six, and that he would show the secrets of wisdom that they are double to that which is, know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Uh, he says, show Job the truth here. Show him how wrong he is. God knows at least twice as much as you do, Job, which is, which is absolutely true. And remember, Job, that God has given you less than your sin deserves. That's absolutely true. That's true for all of us. All of us. But where Zophar's problem was, was he was, he was making application and applying all this tragedy that had happened in Job's life as a result of his sin. And that's where he was really messed up. You and I have always got to be careful about that. Verse number 7. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Well, you can search and find out God now. Now, you're not going to be able to find him to perfection. And in other words, he's... Past finding out, Romans 11, 33 and 34 says, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who, who hath been his counselor? Nobody. <clears throat> but also John 5, 39 says, Search the scriptures. 
For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You and I have something that these men that were arguing didn't have. We have a completed canon, as Brother Bobby so greatly has done, showed us and taught us in the, new, in, the, uh, in the Sunday school. We have a completed Bible. So we can know, listen, we can find out all that we need to know about God. But we may not can find out all there is to know about God, but we can find out all that we need to know about God in a King James Bible. But it's a heart issue, folks. Again, I keep going back to that. It's a heart issue. I know people that know very little Bible. Listen to me. They know very little Bible. Some of them told the NIV. They don't even know the difference. And they love the Lord Jesus Christ. And they care about Jesus Christ. And they're walking with Jesus Christ. And I know people that are King James only, rightly divided, and dispensational, just like we are. And God ain't within a hundred miles of them. You say, why? Because they got a heart problem. Knowing your doctrine and knowing your Bible doesn't make your heart right. Do you understand that? That's why there's so many, so many Bible believers go off, just go off out in the cuckoo land. They get cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You say, how do they do that? When they've been trained right and they know the Bible and they've had good preaching and good teaching and they've been, they know the truth because good doctrine cannot change a bad heart unless you want that bad heart changed. Amen. And when you and I get some little old something stuck down there in our crawl and we can't get rid of it and we won't try to get over it, it just begins to grow and grow and grow and swell until it consumes you. And I'll take that NIV token, charismatic Christian, any day, any day, over the puffed up Bible believer. And God would too. God would too. You got to watch that stuff, folks. Oh, we got to watch it. It is, it is as high as heaven. <laughs> what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? You can't do or know anything that God doesn't first reveal or allow you to know or do. Uh, Psalm 139.8, if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, build the, behold, thou art there. God is everywhere. You're not, gonna, you're not going to get away from God. You're going to have to deal with them some way or another. He says, the measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. God's perfection is immeasurable for man. Verse number 10, if he cut off and shut up or gather together, then who can hinder him? I tell you, nobody can hinder God. Listen to me. If God wants to get something done, if God's for it, no man can hinder God. No man can stop God. So listen, listen, this fellow's saying a lot of theological statements that are very true. But again, he's making the wrong application because there's information he doesn't have. Verse number 11, for he knoweth vain men, he seeth... Wickedness also, will he not then consider it that God knows and he sees the wickedness of man and they will not go unpunished, that's for sure. Uh, Proverbs eleven twenty one says, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. So that's true. God is going to punish the wicked. But again, his problem is, is he's categorizing Job as wicked. Why? Has he seen Job do anything wicked? No. But he just said he's got to be wicked. No man goes through all that that he's went through unless he's wicked. You see how people reason that stuff out? And don't you, don't let's not be too quick to jump on so far because we have some of that bunch around here nowadays that do the same thing. They look at somebody's life and they make up, they surmise and make up this whole deal about what they've done and why God is doing this to them. And you and I have no idea. And, and listen, suppose we were right, okay? Suppose we were right. Suppose we knew what God was doing. Suppose we had the whole thing figured out, all right? Suppose we did. Rather than jumping on somebody and comment to them, shouldn't we have pity on them and pray for them? Suppose I knew that they were going through all this because of their sin. Shouldn't I have pity on them and pray for them rather than jumping on them and being ugly to them? That shows you their heart. See, the same heart that would cause you to surmise is the same heart condition that would cause you to be rough on people who might be going through the judgment of God. 
God doesn't want us doing that. God doesn't want us doing that. For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Vain men cannot be wise no matter how much they seek it because true wisdom comes from the fear of the Lord. And we are stubborn and self-willed like that ass's colt until Christ tames us. Now, if you're reading the Bible, you'll see that a, that a, a wild ass is a picture of a lost man. And boy, if you, if you want to picture a lost man, there's no better animal in the Bible than a wild ass. And you remember that Jesus Christ, when he comes into Jerusalem, do you remember what it says about him? That he rode upon a what? That had what? Never been ridden. That was a picture of what he was going to do. Jesus Christ has to tame the man. Jesus Christ has to take that old wild uh, donkey, brand donkey. Uh, any of you ever been a brand donkey? Can you admit it? That first house that me and Darby lived in when we first got married way out there in the country, our neighbor across the fence, he had an old donkey out there. And all times of the night and all times of the morning, it didn't matter when it was, you could be out in the yard, you never knew it was coming, but he'd start out with a, with a long, oh, 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 oh. How many of you have ever heard that? That's pretty good imitation, wasn't it? <laughs> but we're like that wild donkey, man. We have to be tamed, and the only way we can be tamed is by the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have any hope of ever getting right with the Lord unless my Savior does it. The Savior has to put that bit and bridle on me and calm me down. Verses 13 and 14, if thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. He tells Job to check his heart and reach toward God and repent of your sin and <laughs> send your money into us because if you're really right with God, you'll support our ministry and all that nonsense. For then thou shalt... For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. He says you can be steadfast and not live in fear and uncertainty if you just confess this and just get right. There's also some tribulation aspect of this too. Because in the tribulation period, and especially when you read the book of uh, James, man, it's especially, now we are practically, right now we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. But it really means something when you get in that tribulation period. Uh, period. Uh, James 1.27, pure religion, undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow in their affliction, to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we, we need to keep ourselves unspotted from the world, but I think this has some tribulation aspect to it as well. Because thou shalt remember, I told you that Job is a type of a, of a Jew in the tribulation period. Verse number 16, because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it was waters that pass away. You'll forget all you've been through. Really? Maybe in heaven. It's, it'll be like, it'll, you know, we say we have that statement now in the world, water under the bridge. It's just water under the bridge. Well, it can, might be like that's water under the bridge, but I'm going to tell you, you can move on, but there's some things that's hard to forget, isn't it? It's just hard to forget some things. Now, God can help us to overcome it and go on, but it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to forget it. Verse number 17, And thine age shall be clearer than the, than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. Again, that's a second Advent passage, as the morning. Um, when you read some verses like over there in Matthew 13 and Malachi 4, we're not going to cover that, but, just, but that does have uh, some... Uh, uh, second Advent references going into the millennial. Remember, uh, you're going to find this all through the book of Job if you're looking for it. And uh, if I was, I could slow down and take some more time and talk about some of those. But again, I don't want to stay in the book a terribly long time and, and get everybody bogged down. So we're going to go through some of this and, and more rapidly than in other places. Thou shalt be secure because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee and thou shalt take thy rest in Safety. He said, you'll feel secure and live with hope when you're right with God. Of course, the millennial aspect is you're going to have rest and the Jews going to be back on top. Um, Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. 
Um, you, it says, Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out thereby. In their sight shall thou bear it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, that thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. A lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is being applied to the nation of Israel. As I did as I was commanded, I brought forth my stuff by day as stuff for captivity. And in the evening, I dig through the wall with mine hand. I brought it forth in the twilight, and I bear it upon my shoulder, <coughs> excuse me, in their sight. So talking about that digging and taking rest and in safety. Uh, also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee. Again, this is, this is a second advent uh, application, I do believe. Um, where the remnant, remember there's a remnant of the Jews that's going to be spared in the tribulation period. But the righteous can, ought to be able to sleep without fear. That's the practical application to us. Again, as we close in, in this chapter, uh, verse number 20, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail and they shall not escape and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Uh, again, I think that has a second advent passage, but here we go devotionally, the wicked are doomed. They're not going to escape. I like this verse in Hebrews which I think can be applied in our dispensation and in the tribulation period. Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed in us by them that heard him. I'm going to tell you how we're going to escape. We're not going to escape. You cannot neglect the salvation of the Lord and expect to escape. And you cannot neglect the God. One day, one day that thing's going to come back on you. Listen. I preached a message, and I think I might have preached it here, but I, I can't remember because I've got thousands of messages filed away, and I can't remember sometimes what I preach and what I haven't. But I preach a message entitled, Pilot's Mistake. And do you know what Pilot's Mistake was? Pilot's Mistake is the same mistake that many people all over this world make. Pilot thought he could go in there and wash his hands and say, okay, I gave Christ over. They beat him. They crucified the Lord. He's dead. I washed my hands of it. I'm finished with it. I don't have to revisit this ish issue anymore. It's over. But listen, it's never over. For the saved, we're going to meet him again one day at the judgment seat. For the lost, you're going to meet him again at the white throne judgment. You cannot wash your hands of God and say, okay, it's over. It's never over. Maybe you go 5 and 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, but you and I are going to settle up with God one day. More, more, more like this. He's going to settle up with us. He's going to get what's coming from us. So it's very foolish for us to think somehow or another we're going to get out of this and everything's going to be, you know, I, I just put that, that, that's just water under the bridge. That's just, no, it's not. Now, quickly, we'll move on to this next chapter. I'll get you out of here by, by 6 o'clock, Lord willing. Job answered and said, this is Job's response now to all this nonsense going on. No doubt, but you are the people and wisdom shall die with you. He said, yep, you're the man, Zophar. When you die, so does all wisdom. I just wish everybody was here to hear you wax so eloquent and... Um, Tell your stuff, man. You got the, you got the goods. I, I can't believe I don't know what you know. Uh, verse number three. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as thee? He said, I also know and understand some things too, brother. And I'm not inferior, inferior to you, no matter how much you talk down to me. And everything you're trying to tell me, I already know. <laughs> Verse number four, I am as one mocked of his neighbor who calleth upon God, and he answereth him, the just upright man is laugh to scorn. He said, you're mocking me, but I'm an upright man. And verse number five, he that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. He said, you're so sure of your footing and you're so sure of your direction that you refuse a lamp to get you through the darkness. And that's how they were. That's how they were. They, 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 are, they are so confident. Listen, listen, listen. Don't, get, don't lose this. They are so confident and fixated on what all's wrong with Job. They don't know what all's wrong with them. Amen. You see it? We get so fixated and concentrated on what's wrong with somebody else, we don't even realize what all's wrong with us. God help us. 
We ought to be much more concerned about what's wrong with us than everybody else. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised, and the thought of him is that is of him that is at ease. Uh, verse number six: The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure. Into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. God allows the wicked to prosper and to be deceived into thinking that they have gotten away with with it. Or either Job's just being sarcastic here because he's sort of down on what God has done. He's sort of down on how God has helped him. And uh, so he's just being uh, sarcastic about the thing, and, and, um, but, but it could have both applications. Verse number 7, But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls are there, and they shall tell thee. The beasts and the birds can teach you a few things. Now, I'm not, I have a bunch of verses listed here, but we're not going to go over them tonight. But there are several verses that mention animals in the Bible. Uh, the ox, and bulls, and uh, dogs. And wolves, a lot of false prophets, and and um, um, there's all kind of animals in there. You and I can learn a lot about the Lord Jesus Christ by by animals. We can just do that if we pay attention to them and listen. Uh, they have really good lessons to teach us and to show us. Verse number eight: Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. The earth. And um, notice that it'll teach you. Now, remember on the earth, trees are like in the men, and fish, uh, men are like in the fish. So anytime in the Bible, when you're looking at the earth, the earth is like into a sea of people. Fish are like in the men, make you fishermen, fishers of men. Trees on the earth are like in the men, and you can always make an application out of that if you, if you look for it. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. The earth, listen, the earth will teach you. The fishes in the sea shall declare to thee. Listen, listen. That's why it says over there in the book of Romans that man is without excuse when he says he doesn't believe God because all creation bears witness that there is a God. And you can learn all kind of lessons when you look at nature and see what God has there for you. Verse number 9, who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? I tell you who don't know, college professors, atheists, philosophers, Darwin, Einstein, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, people that are taught to be an atheist they somehow know within that there must I believe they somehow know within that there must be a supreme creator but they don't want to admit it because if they admit that there's a supreme creator then they've got to also admit that they are responsible to answer to that supreme creator and whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind our soul is in the hand of God to do whatever he wishes to do with us and he gives us our next breath or he does it Give you the next breath. Doth not the ear try words and the mouth taste his meat? Yeah. Ears are for hearing, the mouth is for eating. Yeah. Job's, Job's trying to say, listen, man, y'all come up here jumping on me. I know a little bit too. Uh, verses 12 and 13. With the ancient is wisdom and the length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength he hath counsel and understanding. Now he could be talking about the ancient, a black people before the flood. And all the ancient people before his time. Listen, the older you and I get, the more wisdom we ought to have to give to these younger people. But the main ancient one that he could be talking about here is the ancient of days. That's where all wisdom comes from. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. Behold, he breaketh down and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man and there can be no opening. You know, if God tears it down and he doesn't want it rebuilt, it's not going to be rebuilt. If God shuts it up like he shut up that door with Noah and his family, no one else is going to get in. When God says it's over, it's over. When God says it's going to begin, it's going to begin. God is in control of all this stuff. So listen, Job and his friends are making good comments. They're, they're bantering back and forth. They're throwing shots at each other. And a lot of what both sides are saying, a lot about what both sides are doing is 100% correct. But it doesn't mean that they're done in the right spirit necessarily. 
Verse number 15, Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. God can flood you out, or God can dry you out. That's all up to God. Verse number 16, With him is strength and wisdom. He deceived, and the deceiver are his. Do you know that strength and wisdom is from God, and God is in, is in control of the deceivers, and he's in the control of the deceived. Listen to me, listen to me. The deception that's going on in our world today, God is behind that and he's allowing it. Now, this is where it gets fuzzy and people don't want to hear this. But let me tell you something. There is nothing going to happen that God ain't in charge of. And God many times gives people what they want. And people have itching ears and they don't want the truth and they get offended with the truth and they can't handle the truth and they're not looking for the truth. And God says, okay, I'm going to give you, as they say down there where I'm from, a pushback belly full of heresy. Here you go. Take it. 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's God that does that. He allows that. He allows these deceivers. Listen, God can shut down the deceivers anytime he wanted to. But what do you think about here in America? What God is doing in America is giving us exactly what we deserve. We deserve a bunch of phony baloney preachers. We deserve a bunch of nonsense. We deserve to be misled. We deserve to be deceived because we are a country full of the devil. Everybody was with me this morning when he was talking about cheer up. I'm just as right about what I'm saying tonight as I was this morning when I said cheer up. We are getting what we deserve because of our unrighteousness. Verse number 18, or verse number 17. He leadeth counselors away, spoiled, and maketh the judges fools. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. He, 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 can, he can spoil you. He sent, the Neb he sent Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, that very wicked nation, in to destroy his people. He allowed them to come in there and do unmentionable things to those people. They wound up eating their own children. You say, who would, who would send somebody in there where people would get so desperate they would eat their own children? God. You want to fool with God? You want to reject God? You would say, we don't want God in this country. We don't want God in our lives. We want to do our own thing. God would. And God did, does. He looseth the bond of kings and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He sets kings up and he brings them down. Amen. He leadeth princes away spoiled and overthroweth the mighty. He will bring in godless nations to judge another. He does that. Verse number 20, notice this. He removeth away the speech of the trusty and taketh away the understanding of the aged. He says he takes away the understanding of the aged. Now you can look at that in a couple of different ways that you get older people that have not grown in spirituality. They have not got the gray hairs. They're not found in righteousness. Or it can be a senile or dementia that God allows. Of course, there's a lot of righteous, very righteous people that get dementia. I'm not mentioning that. But sometimes, well, let's just go ahead and put it right out there. How about that? What about our president? What about our president? Have you, listen, I'm not making fun of him. That's very likely I'm going to wind up the same way. But have you ever seen such a mess? Such a mess, that's the leader of our country. And you say, how in the world did Biden get in there? They fixed the, ele the elections. They, they rigged the thing. That all might be very true, but i tell you how he got in there. God gave us a senile, old, wicked man to lead this country because that's what this country deserves. Amen. And you need to understand that. Verse number 21, he poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. Yeah. And I believe he's doing that to America right now. You know, with our military, our education, our economy. Verse number 22, he, he discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. I was going to turn there. We don't have time tonight. Read to Job 26. 
verses 5 through 14, how God transforms things and makes things and he reveals things and he's, he's spread out the universe. He's, he's done it all. Everything that's been made has been made by him and for him. He's a powerful God. Verse 23, he increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. Amen. God has destroyed men many a time. He's destroyed world powers and he's increased the power of many a nation. That's all up to him. Look at the nation of Egypt and Babylon and Rome and Greece and Persia and England. He's, all, he's wiped them all out at times. And America is next on the list. I said America is next on the list. How in the world do we think that God's going to deal with all these other unrighteous nations and he's not going to deal with us? That's foolish. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Wander in the wilderness. Again, that's a tribulation aspect. That's what they're going to be doing, the Jews in the tribulation. And listen, there's no way. If God doesn't make a way... God doesn't make a way, there is no way. Listen to me tonight. If God doesn't make a way for this country or make a way for this church or make a way for us, well, what? he makes the way. And he says, I am the way. And he also says, the way of transgressors is hard. We better get on his road and walk with him and do what he says because when we're on the opposite road, it's rough. They grope in the dark without light and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. All nations but Israel will grope without the light at the second advent. That is absolutely true. And you know a drunk man is deceived. He's unalert. He's incapable of making good decisions. He's weak and he's useless, isn't he? And that's what we are when we get so messed up in our sin. Now listen again. Listen again as we make a few final comments and close this tonight. Please get this. Zophar, like his two buddies that went before him, Bildad and Eliphaz, he makes a judgment call on a man suffering without all the information. That's what they're doing to Job at this time. Listen, don't do that. Don't do that. Three reasons why. Number one, you and I do not know a man's heart and a man's motive. Can you say amen to that? I can never look at your heart and I can never know your motive. That is only between you and God. Number two, you don't know what God is doing in a man's life. You and I have no idea what's going on in that man's life and what God is doing in that man or that woman's life at the time. The best thing you can do is stay out of the way, not make unsolicited remarks and comments and advice. And if you really, really care about them, instead of just shooting off in the mouth, pray for them. Pray for them. And then number three, we don't know many times how much the devil, as well as God, is involved in something. Sometimes they work so similar, as Dr. Ruppman has said. It's hard to tell, is it the devil or is it God or is it both? That's true sometimes in a person's life. And if you don't believe that, you haven't paid attention to the book of Job. Nobody, including Job, knew what was going on up in heaven between, the God, between God and the devil. But God and the devil. Everybody else was down there speculating and thinking and wondering and shooting off at the mouth. But nobody had the perfect knowledge, not even Job, about what actually was going on in his life. But God and the devil. You and I have got to be very careful. And listen, listen, let's always, always listen. Don't you think, would you agree with this? Don't you think it's always better to err to err and lean toward grace and err on the side of grace rather than judgment. Don't you think God's done that with us? Don't you think he's been awfully gracious and merciful and forgiven to us? Don't you think that God's people ought to be that same way with others? And always remember, boy, if we want God to get in the getting business, then let's don't be hypocrites. God, if you're going to get into getting business, start here with me. Who's stupid enough to pray that? No. No, I, I don't want God to get into getting business. So, amen.